least by the standards of uh, physics, the science of consciousness is, you know, somewhere where physics was maybe a few hundred years ago. So I thought about maybe making this clean secrets uh, instead. But I thought actually maybe we'll do dirty secrets, but so we'll get the dirty secrets and we'll get the uh, we'll get the but. So, okay, number one, dirty secret. We can't define it. There's no good definition of consciousness that will totally uh, convey the phenomenon to someone who hasn't experienced it for themselves. I mean, I'm quite fond of, I'm quite fond of this one. Consciousness, that, that annoying time between naps, but still, um, we have to have been there to, uh, to know what we mean. That said, we do have some useful distinctions, at least, in the, uh, in the area from different things you might mean by consciousness. I mean, one thing is just the distinction between what we might call intelligence, objective behavior, doing sophisticated things, performing sophisticated functions, and consciousness in a sense of experience, subjective experience, what it feels like from the inside, for example, to see, to hear, to feel emotions, and to think. And the really central questions of consciousness are all tied to subjective experience, which is where I'll be focusing here. There are some distinctions between consciousness in the sense of access, an objective mechanistic sense, access to information, um, reflective consciousness, access to internal states that can then be deployed in behavior, and what philosophers call phenomenal consciousness, which again is the experiential sense on which I'll be um, concentrating here. A system is phenomenally Conscious. There's a useful definition, which is about as good as any definition you'll find, due to Tom Nagel and his paper, What It's Like to Be a Bat. See, a system is conscious in the phenomenal sense if there's something it's like to be that system. So my thought is, okay, there's something it's like to be me right now, experiencing. Presumably, there's nothing it's like to be this microphone, though, yeah. who knows. Um, a state is phenomenally conscious. There's something it's like to be in that state. There's something it's like for me to see right now to have a visual experience. There's nothing it's like, for example, for my kidneys to be doing some particular thing um, right now. So that's at least a, a way of getting a grip on the phenomena for those who have, who have been there. Now, next problem, next dirty secret. We can't measure it. Consciousness, by its nature, is private and subjective, directly observable from the first person point of view. Introspectively, I know perfectly well that I'm conscious and a fair amount about what I'm conscious of. Not directly observable from the third person point of view. I can't just, you know, look at a system and immediately read off what it's conscious of. But in practice, we have a way around this, at least in humans. We measure consciousness in humans by the use of verbal reports. We basically take it as a principle that if someone says they're consciously experiencing, say, a red cross in their visual field, then they are. At least unless there's some reason to think something's going wrong, there's some unless there's some reason to believe otherwise. And this practice of relying on verbal introspective reports in humans at least has come to ground the robust science of consciousness in humans, where, for example, we can start to ascertain the neural correlates of consciousness, the brain areas that are active when people report states of consciousness, and so on. This is, of course, a very limited measure. It requires that systems have the ability to report their states. And there is no uncontroversial measure of consciousness in non-human systems that don't have the ability to report. If I want to figure out whether a mouse or a fly is conscious, verbal report is useless, and there's nothing which is even remotely as useful. Of course, there are controversial measures, kind of post-theoretical uh, measures like, say, information integration or whatever. But these are all post-theoretical, and none of them are close to consensus or controversial or uncontroversial measures. Okay, dirty secret number three. We can't explain it. Standard methods, at least, of explanation in the mind and brain sciences are very much designed to explain behavior and objective functions leading up to um, to behavior and explaining, say, learning or memory or language. That, I mean, in the case of consciousness, that works fine for, you know, explaining things like access and report. But these are the easy problems when it comes to consciousness. The basic 
challenge of the field is it seems that explaining all that behavior at best explains the phenomena we were associating with intelligence and doesn't, on the face of it, explain subjective experience. You could explain all those behavioral, functional things, and that would still leave the open question, why is all that accompanied by subjective experience? Why does it feel like something from the inside? That's what we call the hard problem. So it starts to look as if standard methods, wonderful for the easy problems, don't explain phenomenal consciousness, the hard problem. Okay, so that's dirty, not so secret point here. A stronger claim is that no explanation wholly in terms of physical processes will explain consciousness, roughly because all you're going to get from an explanation in terms of physical processes is the explanation of behaviors. Really useful for explaining a whole lot of things throughout nature, from life on up, explaining various behavioral phenomena in psychology. But if I was going to go into this at more length, I'd argue this, in a sense, that's all you're going to get from standard explanation in terms of physics. Again, great for the easy problems, not so great for the hard problems. If you accept that, and I can't defend the claim here, then it starts to look as if, although putting together the fundamentals of physics, whatever they are, space and time and mass and charge, is great for explaining life and great for even explaining behavior, doesn't explain consciousness. If you want to bring consciousness in, you need something more in the picture. And various people have suggested maybe we need to take consciousness itself as a fundamental in our theories. And that's the way I want to go. Can't exactly fully defend that claim here, but I do think it's where you're led to by taking this hard problem of consciousness seriously. Now, but, okay, so we say that's extremely dirty, very bad news, because that means no reductionist theory of consciousness is possible. One, in purely physical terms, but non-reductionist theories are still possible. Non-reductionist theories of consciousness are basically ones that don't try to reduce consciousness, just acknowledge it in its own terms, try to ascertain some of its properties and to connect it to everything else we know about. For example, physical processes in the brain and perhaps ultimately to physics. So we might have some psychophysical principles connecting the mental and the physical by way of certain sets of laws. And that's actually the way that the science of consciousness, if you look at the science of consciousness, and one really cool thing is over the last 20 years, a very robust science of consciousness has started to be developed in neuroscience, in psychology, and so on. Most of it is not reductionist in the way I've been talking about. That's not to say it's not necessarily non-reductionist. Maybe it's just neutral on the question of reductionism. But what it does is it doesn't try and fully explain consciousness in terms of, say, underlying neural processes. It assumes consciousness and tries to connect it to neural processes, say, by finding neural correlates of consciousness. At a somewhat more general and universal level, um, Giulio Tononi, who's here, has uh, developed the integrated inf information theory of consciousness, which I think is a nice example of a, uh, of a non-reductive theory of consciousness that makes a connection between consciousness and certain computational or informational processes. Giulio will be talking about this later, but he's got his measure phi of integrated information, and the thought is the amount of consciousness goes along with the degree of phi, integrated information. Giulio is quite explicit. This is not intended as a reduction of consciousness. He takes the existence of consciousness as a starting point, but he assumes it, and he thinks, okay, what can we connect it to that we understand at the information processing level? And he's got this bold hypothesis about how it works. Of course, it's still very early days, and any proposal that right now is out there is probably going to turn out to be wrong, but it's nice to have proposals like this on the table. Okay, next dirty secret. We don't know what it does. Just about, you know, what is consciousness for? What does it cause? Just about any behavior that we think consciousness might explain can be explained, it seems, without invoking consciousness. So you say consciousness is for planning or for decision making or for responding or for withdrawing your hand from the flame or, or something, but it starts to look as if there's a story about what explains that in terms of brain processes that never needs to mention subjective experience anywhere. So pretty well right now, no one knows what the function of consciousness is. Many proposals, nothing like a consensus. That said, this does, I think, connect to some of the issues here 
at the conference about possible roles for observation in physics. At least some possible roles for observers in observation in physics might suggest some possible roles for a consciousness. And I'll just leave that hanging for now and return to that in a few minutes towards the, uh, the end of the talk when I start to speculate wildly. Um, OK, so those are four dirty secrets. But dirty secret number five is despite all these problems, uh, we can't explain it, and we can't measure it, and we can't define it, and we don't know what it does. Um, nevertheless, we can't ignore it. Yeah, I mean, you, might, you might say, OK, well, screw consciousness then. But, uh, but we can't ignore it. Consciousness is a datum. It's arguably the central datum of our existence. Yeah, Descartes said this is the one thing about the world that we know more certainly than any other. Now, I do think it's a, resp it's a respectable approach to the problems of consciousness to deny that claim and try to argue, in fact, this datum is a kind of an illusion. And people like Dan Dennett have tried to take that approach. It hasn't proved very popular. It hasn't generally proved terribly plausible. It's really hard to work out that view. Um, but I think if you, if you want to oppose the kind of non-reductionist view that I take, it's probably best to try and deny the datum and try to take a view of consciousness as an illusion. But if you don't take that approach, which most people don't, you've got to take this as a datum. But you've got to accommodate it in your theories somewhere. And we won't have a theory of everything without a theory of consciousness. So physics has this ambition to build this great chain of explanation for physics, chemistry, biology, psychology, whatever consciousness is going to have to get in there somewhere. And right now, um, it's kind of standing outside like a sore thumb. So we have to bring it in somewhere. And it's great to see that you know, some people in this group are, are taking these questions about consciousness seriously. Furthermore, for our local purposes here, in understanding observers and the role of the observer, say, in physical theories. I kind of think that we can't really understand observers without understanding consciousness. There's a tie between the notion of observation, or at least certain key notions of observation and consciousness. So it's pretty crucial for some local purposes here. So I'll get to that theme next, then, the question of what is an observer. I mean, one, in one sense of observer, obs observation is kind of trivial. You might think observation is just registration of one physical system on another. You get an observation whenever one entity has some reliable effect on another, one particle affects another in a reliable way. This one can be said to make an observation or a registration of the state of another. In that sense, you know, even a classical particle will be or can be an observer. Well, maybe that's one sense of observation. I'm inclined to think that for many purposes within physics, this is not the relevant sense. I mean, one thing I think is going to come out is that in different domains of physics, different notions, different notions of observer and, ob and observation are relevant. Maybe in relativity, something like this sense is all you need. I think in quantum mechanics and cosmology, something more robust is, uh, is needed. Then, then the question is, uh, what distinguishes observation from registration? I think that's kind of a challenge for anyone who wants a robust notion of observation that doesn't just collapse into registration. And the obvious suggestion, I think, is that what marks the difference is something mental. Observers are people who perceive or who know or who are conscious. And that means that, you know, once you start talking about observation, you're up to your, your ears and the philosophy of mind, whether you, uh, you like it or not. Maybe. People think there's some intermediate sense where, like, say, a camera gets to be an observer, but, a, uh, but a, uh, a particle does not. Then I think the challenge is to try to articulate that sense without drawing very arbitrary lines. Sense two, then, sense I'm interested in, is observation equals conscious perception. There, there's a very non-arbitrary line. Observation is something really pretty special. Certainly, the observations that we make as human observers all involve conscious perception consciously observing the, uh, the state of a system and experiencing it. In that sense, observers are conscious perceivers. And that's the sense that I'm interested to focus on. Another question very relevant for this conference, I think, is what is the theoretical role of observation in physical theories? And I think well, one thing that's going to come out is there are many such roles for observation. We can't reduce it to one such role. There's probably different roles for observation in cosmology, in quantum mechanics, in relativity. Some roles, I think, are epistemological. Observation is a guide to the correct physical or cosmological 
theory, not part of the theory itself. Epistemological means this is about knowledge. So, for example, weak anthropic reasoning and cosmology might take our existence as observers as a data point that helps constrain the correct cosmological theory without observers playing any fundamental role within those theories. I mean, there are strong anthropic um, principles that go for something stronger, but I take it that approach is much less popular in cosmology. But maybe some roles are ontological. This is the much more radical suggestion that observation is somehow part of a physical or cosmological theory, playing a role somehow in the dynamics or the basic principles. Now, I suppose in cosmology, strong anthropic reasoning would give you an instance of that. But the obvious other physical theory where you might look for this kind of phenomenon is traditional quantum mechanics, which at least prima facie gives a central role to this notion of measurement or observation in the dynamics. Here I mean that traditional thing you learn in some textbooks with Schrodinger evolution and then this other special thing that happens upon measurement that seems to involve some special dynamics of collapse. This is at least one of the many things that sometimes get called the Copenhagen interpretation that I'm inclined to agree to, uh, to think that term is somewhat useless now because it means so many different things. Um, so if you're interested in possible roles for consciousness and observation within physical theories, that's at least uh, one interesting place to look. And you might think that theories of consciousness could help to play at least some clarifying role here. So that's going to be my final section. It's just thinking a little bit about what theories of consciousness might say about role of observation in traditional quantum mechanics. I mean, it's fair to say, I think, that this kind of traditional interpretation of quantum mechanics is extremely unpopular, at least among uh, people working on quantum foundations. Uh, and, you know, I'm myself quite sympathetic with other interpretations like, uh, like Everett, plus decoherence, and so on. That said, I'm inclined to think that traditional collapse on measurement interpretations have been somewhat under-theorized um, recently and deserve a little bit more attention. They're often rejected because they give an ontological role to observers and measurement. And how could that play a role in a fundamental physical theory? And really, there's at least two worries here. First, this whole notion of observation or measurement is incredibly vague and imprecise. How could something so vague and imprecise play a role in physical dynamics? A second, somewhat related worry is the notion of observation is non-fundamental. Observation and measurement, that's this very high-level thing involving consciousness, again, totally unfit for a role in fundamental physical dynamics. I think those are reasonable reactions. Still, in the context of thinking about fundamental theories of consciousness, say of IIT and so on, those worries at least become somewhat reduced. If we had a rigorous fundamental theory of consciousness with precise psychophysical laws, this I think would tend to remove both worries, yielding a precise collapse interpretation of quantum mechanics. A, we'd have something fundamental playing the role. B, we'd have precise conditions for collapse. So take, for example, Tononi's integrated information theory, which purports to give precise conditions for the existence of consciousness. Well, here's a thought. Let's do a mashup of IIT with quantum collapse theories and say, okay, IIT gives you the condition for consciousness or for, uh, or for observation. Phi above threshold gives you consciousness. And then when that happens, that's the condition for collapse. Well, now at least we have precise conditions for collapse. Now, I'm not saying this is the correct theory. There'll turn out to be a whole range of precise collapse interpretations of quantum mechanics corresponding to different precise theories of consciousness. And although imprecision is often put forward as a problem for these theories, I think you could also almost see it as a feature. We've got a whole range of theories now which we can we actually experimentally try to distinguish in principle. Of course, each of these theories can be experimentally distinguished in principle through experiments involving interferometers and the like. Extremely difficult to do um, right now, but at least in the long term, there's the possibility of experimentally distinguishing these different precise consciousness collapse interpretations of quantum mechanics. So here's a project, which I'm just recommending to you as a, uh, as a project. Articulate precise collapse theories of quantum mechanics of this sort, and then experimentally test them. Now, there's any number of obvious obstacles to both of those parts, both to articulating the theories and to testing them. But I do think it's a, th it's a, uh, 
it's a project at least worth thinking about. A couple of people from Oxford came up with one um, collapse theory, Kremniser and Ranchin in this spirit. My old student Kelvin McQueen, who's now at Chapman, and I have been thinking about this project too. In any case, it's a project to be carried out. If successful, this project would yield an experimentally verified interpretation of quantum mechanics, a theory of consciousness, a role for consciousness in the physical world, and even a way of measuring consciousness, thus enabling us to clean up some of those dirty secrets from the start. Oh, look, I think it's a long shot, but at least it's, I think it's, um, it ought to be at least in the space of possible interpretations of quantum mechanics, so I'm done. I think this is at least a theory, a reason for theorists of consciousness to pay some attention to physics, because some pay off in thinking about theories of consciousness, and for physicists to pay at least some attention to consciousness. Thanks.